gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> Detective Sergeant, you're assigned to robbery detail. Two armed bandits have robbed a large jewelry store in your city. One of the suspects escapes. One is apprehended. He's identified as a friend of yours. Your job, send him to prison. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, February 8th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way over from the city hall, and it was 8.35 p.m. when I got to the second floor of the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Treatment room. Joe, hi. Hi, Doc. Ben, how's it going? Okay. It hurt for a while. Doc gave me an injection. Six of a grain of morphine, Novocaine injection. Bullet still on your shoulder? Doc's about ready to take it out. As soon as I get the wound cleaned, here's the soap and water nurse. Alcohol sponge, please. How's it look, Doctor? Well, there's the x-ray, shallow penetrating wound in the deltoid area. Mm-hmm. Slabs larger than the soft tissue right here. Oh, yeah. No bone involvement. Okay, the bullet was spent. That's good. Feel okay? Sure. Nurse, methylate applicators, please. Thanks. Let's see now. Where'd you leave Tyler, Joe? Interrogation room. Reynolds and Thompson are with him. Let me have the probe, nurse. Yeah. Feel anything, Romero? No. That's it. You hear that? Hear what? Located the slug with the probe. Oh. Nice. Cross it. Thanks. Here we go. Oh, it's steady. You call your wife? No, she don't know where I... There it is, boys. Want to mark it for evidence? Yeah, give it to me, will you? I will. Nurse, sterile saline solution. Here, get the wound. No sign of Tyler's partner, huh, Joe? Guy got me? No, not yet, no. Sterile dressings, please. How long did you know this, Tyler? Before he went wrong, I mean. I met him in the Army. Helped him line up a job when he got on. It's too bad. Sure is funny. Making a friend of yours pull an armed robbery. Must have surprised you, huh? Yeah, kind of. You want me to drive you home when the doc's finished, Joe? Let's go back to the office and talk to Tyler first. Okay. Is that all right, Doc? No. You're staying right here, Romero, till tomorrow morning. If you haven't got a temperature by then, I might release it. Oh, it's only a flesh wound, Doc. I feel all right. I'm not taking any chances with gunshot wounds. If infection set in and you were laid up, I'd have the pension committee to answer to. You're staying here. Sounds like an order. It is. You can pick him up in the PNF ward tomorrow morning. Okay. You gonna need anything, Ben? Yeah. A phone to tell my wife I won't be home for dinner. His name was Max Tyler, white. Male American, age 32. Dark hair, brown eyes, medium build. Married, father of twin boys. He was a friend of mine. We served together in the Army overseas, and when the war finished, I came back to my job on the force, and Max went back to his old job. It didn't fit him anymore. He stopped working and started drinking. His wife didn't help much. Max started with small trouble, but it grew fast. On the afternoon of February the 8th, Tuesday, Ben and I surprised two men holding up a Main Street jewelry shop. Shots were exchanged, and Ben received a flesh wound in the shoulder. One of the hold-up men escaped. The other one was apprehended. His name was Max Tyler. Hi, Larry. Hi, Joe. 
Glad you got here. Tyler says he won't talk to anybody but you. Okay, boy. Thanks for standing by. Sure. I'll be outside if you need anything. Max? Joe? You're in deep this time. You shot a cop. I didn't. There's a guy who was with me. I didn't fire it once. You were in on the job. Yeah. Then don't expect presents. I don't expect anything, Joe. Glad you came back. I, I don't want to talk to those other cops. I work in the same department they do, same job. Well, it's easier to talk to you. What's your story? I was crazy to try it. No alibis, Joe, but I, I didn't know what I was doing. Believe me, I, I just didn't realize. I won't buy it, Max. You told me the same thing 14 months ago when they picked you up for those bum checks you were passing. Sure, I hung some paper, but I'm no hood, Joe. You know that. I, I was drinking. I needed dough for Dorothy and the kids. you got to believe me. I need a break. You said that before, too. I went to bat for you, got off with six months and three years probation. Now you turn up with another caper. I know, Joe, I know. I'm sorry. You're sorry once, Max, and it works, but one free ride's enough for anybody. Now, that's it. Did I say I wanted that kind of a break? I'll, I'll serve my time, Joe. I'll serve every day I owe. I mean, what can you tell me you couldn't have told the other cops? I want to ask you a favor. Yeah? I know you're going to hook me on this. So while I'm doing my time... Dorothy and the kids are staying with relatives out in Inglewood. If you well, just keep an eye on them, you know, Joe. I, I don't mean Doe. Dorothy can work with. Kind of watch out for them, huh? Give them a break, Joe. It's not their fault. We do it, Joe. Yeah. Sure, I'll take care of it. Now you do something for me. Anything you want, guy. Let's have the straight story. Who was the guy with you on that holdup this afternoon? Cresta, George Cresta. You know him. Out of Folsom, short guy, black hair. Yeah, yeah. He's got a room above the Red Owl Bar down on East Third near Broadway. That's where he hangs out. Where can we find Cresta now? Oh, well, maybe there. I don't know. I'll give you a list of the places he goes. Some of his friends I've met. He sure wrote me in. Said there wasn't going to be any rough stuff. You were carrying an S&W 38? Sure, sure. When they got outside the jewelry shop, Cresta jammed the gun in my hand. I had to put it away, get it out of sight. Believe me, Joe, he roped me into this. It sounds like an alibi, no, This but is I your could... second time around, Max. It sounds like one. Okay, I got nothing coming. Don't forget about Dorothy and the kids. Huh? I promised you. Now, you want to give me a full statement on the holdup now? Anything you say, Joe. I'll call for a stenographer. Joe. Yeah? I'm sorry. I am. I believe you. You got the feeling too late, that's all. Max Tyler was arraigned in municipal court two days later. Bail was set at $10,000. Three days after that came his preliminary hearing in municipal court. At his arraignment in superior court, five weeks after he'd been apprehended, Tyler entered a plea of not guilty. A date was set for his trial in superior court. Meantime, the hunt for George Cresta, Max's accomplice, went on. There wasn't a sign of him. Our informants had no lead on him, and the all-points bulletin containing all the information we had on Cresta brought in nothing. On Monday, March 22nd, the trial of Max Tyler was held in Superior Court. Ben and I were subpoenaed to appear. The victim of the holdup, the jewelry store manager, was the first to testify. He was questioned by both the prosecutor and the counsel for the defense. He left the stand at 11.25 a.m. If it please, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Before the next witness testifies, I'd like permission to approach the bench. Permission granted. Counsel and prosecution, we also put... Wonder what that's all about, Joe. Something's up. I know. The judge is shaking his head. Public defender's going back to the counsel's table. Counsel for the defense. Your Honor, it's my client's desire to change his plea to guilty. Oh. Defendant rise and face the court. Max Tyler, is that your true name? Yes, Your Honor. On the 12th day of March of this year, in Superior Court, Department 83, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California, you have heretofore been arraigned on the charge of robbery in the first degree. At that time, you pled not guilty to the charge in question. Is it now your desire to change that plea? Yes, sir, it is. You've reached this decision of your own free will? Yes, I have. There's been no force employed, no promise of gratuity or reward to induce you to reach this decision? No, sir. Counsel for the prosecution. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> Max Tyler, on the 12th day of March of this year in Superior Court, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California, you are arraigned on the charge of robbery in the first degree. 
That time you entered a plea is set forth in this information. How do you now plead? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is it stipulated that at the time of the commission of the robbery, the defendant was armed with a deadly weapon to wit a revolver? So stipulated. Court to fix his degree of robbery at robbery the first degree. Your Honor, in the interest of justice, the people moved to dismiss count two, assault with a deadly weapon. At this time, Your Honor, the defendant weighs time for sentencing and asks that he be sentenced immediately. Just a moment. <coughs> Max Tyler, it's the judgment of this court that on the 8th day of February of this year, you did enter the premises at 23108 East Main Street in the city and there did attempt the felonious taking of personal property in the possession of another from his person in immediate presence and against his will. Further, said attempt was made while you were armed with a dangerous and deadly weapon. Sarah, <laughs> this court finds you guilty of robbery in the first degree. Count two is dismissed. Does it, Joe? The decision of this court is to be returned to the county jail. The sheriff will transfer you to the state penitentiary where you will serve the sentence as prescribed by law. Court for sentence 15 minutes. Joe, Miss Tyler over there, she's taking it pretty hard. Yeah, come on, we better go see her. Hello, Dorothy. I love him, Joe. What am I going to do without him? Children. I'll give it to you straight, Dorothy. You didn't do much to keep Max out of this. You drank right along with him. You don't Joe, deserve those kids. That's my opinion. Please, I know it. Don't make it any harder. Don't. I'll do anything I can for the kids, Dorothy. That's all. What am I going to do without him? I can't be all alone without Max. It's not right. It's not right. Neither is armed robbery. Goodbye, Dorothy. Before the end of March, Max Tyler was delivered to San Quentin State Penitentiary where he started serving his term. His wife, Dorothy Tyler, got a job as a telephone operator. She and her children continued living with their relatives down in Inglewood. I helped them out whenever I could. Six months went by. Every two weeks, faithfully, Tyler wrote me a letter from prison. I answered most of them. While Ben and I worked on other jobs, the search for George Preston went on. We failed to uncover a single lead. Ten months passed. Tuesday, January 16th, 1949, 4 p.m. I checked in for work as usual. Hi, Joe. Cold out, huh? Yeah. Did you pick up the mail? Mm Mm-hmm. There's a letter in your box from San Quentin. Tyler, huh? How's he doing, anyway? Good. Clean record. Got himself a pretty fair job in the prison library. Yeah. I talked to the warden up there. Says Tyler ought to be eligible for parole in about a year if he keeps his nose clean. You going to bat for Tyler again? I don't know. See what happens. How can you see anything in that guy? He's giving you nothing but trouble. Oh, a lot of people are giving him the same. Maybe that explains it. Not for me, it doesn't. I wouldn't trust him with dirty laundry. I get it. Robbery Friday. Oh, Joe. Miss Dorothy Tyler. I got to talk to you. Yeah, Dorothy. What's the matter? I found Christus. I saw him. What? George Christus. I know where he is. I saw him downtown. I followed him to his place. You sure it was him? I'm positive. He's staying at 134 Jesse Street. It's a rooming house just off Alameda. One, three, four, Jesse. Got it. Thanks, Dorothy. Come on, Ben. Eight minutes later, Ben and I were interviewing the landlord at 134 Jesse Street, a cheap rooming house down on the south end of the city. The landlord's name was Peterson. We showed him Cresta's mug shot, and he told us he was in room 11. We went up a dark, narrow stairway to the second floor. Stand clear. I'll try the door. Mm-hmm. It's open. Yeah. Joe, have a look. He's asleep. He's passed out. Come on, slip the cuffs on him. That was easy. Yeah. All right, I got his gun. He's been drinking all right. He'll have a big hangover. He'll have a long time to get over it. George Cresta was booked at county jail on suspicion of robbery. Two months and three weeks later in Superior Court, he was tried and convicted of assault with a deadly weapon and first-degree robbery and sentenced to the state penitentiary. The day after Cresta was sentenced, I was called to the office of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. Friday, this Max Tyler is coming up for parole in a couple of months. He's a friend of yours, isn't he? That's right, in a way. You've been writing letters to the warden. you talked to the parole board about him. Understand you're helping on his kids. A few presents. They haven't had much of a break. They're just youngsters. Mm, working hard to get Tyler's parole. Do you think he's worth it? 
Well, I was off both him and his wife, and, and then she gave us that tip about Cresta, and Tyler's got such a good record up at Q, I figured they'd earned another chance. You're sticking your chin out, Joe, helping a con to get a parole. I think you'll realize that. Well, I believe he's a good risk now, Chief. He's pretty weak in some things. He needs direction, that's all. His wife's getting better. She might help more than she did. I hope both of them are worth it. If anything happens, I know I'm going to get it from all sides. You really think some men deserve another chance, don't you? Yes, sir, I do. I wouldn't want you working for me if you didn't. Two more weeks went by. Tuesday, April the 19th. Ben came down with a bad cold and had to lay off work. At the same time, a new gang started a hold-up campaign among the liquor stores out in the Wilshire district. A new rash of armed robberies broke out in the central area. It was an attempted bank robbery. It was a bad week. Ben got back to work on Saturday. Rough time, huh, Joe? Busy, yeah. Did you beat that cold all right? Sure, I feel much better. Doctor gave me some new medicine. Works good. Oh, that's fine. Maybe I'll knock off early tonight if nothing's doing. That's a good idea. Shouldn't be Joe, too much tonight. Tell the type for you. Just came in. Oh, thanks, Larry. Sure. What's the matter, Joe? What is it? Max Tyler. He broke out of prison this morning. listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima doubled, tripled, and quadrupled its smokers. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobacco, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima tops in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of great smoking enjoyment, buy Fatima in the appealing golden yellow package. You'll agree, Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. In the course of his career, the police officer has afforded two diverse views of the criminal. At first, the rookie cop is taught to distrust the criminal at every turn, without exception. He's schooled in the thousand and one ways in which the criminal operates, his psychology, his mode of operation. Then, when he's thoroughly acquainted with the methods of the criminal and how best to detect them, the police officer starts to learn the most difficult lesson of all how to distinguish between the confirmed criminal and the lawbreaker, in whom there is hope of rehabilitation. After nine and a half years of police work, my first experiment in this field was with Max Tyler. I'd given him two chances to prove himself, and he'd lost on both of them. So did I. Two months before his parole hearing, which might have given him his freedom, Max Tyler had suddenly decided to escape. How he figured it, I didn't know, but it was my job to find him. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I met in the chief of detectives' office. Two officers, Holland and Grayson, from the state adult authority, escape detail were there. How did Tyler manage his escape, Grayson? Well, same old story. They figured they could trust him up there. He had a good job on the prison farm, and they trusted him. When did they find out he was gone? On the early morning count. Have you checked his relatives out in Inglewood yet? Yeah, we have. We've got the home staked out. We're covering all the places we figure he might go. Well, how about Mrs. Tyler? You get in touch with her Friday? Her relatives told us that she's on a weekend vacation with the two kids, staying with friends down at Laguna Beach. We got a call in to them. Should be hearing from them soon. I understand Tyler's a friend of yours, Friday. He was ready for parole. Yeah. I was trying to help it along. I thought the guy deserved a break. He didn't need you, Joe. He made his own. Well, he was feeling bad. You weren't the only one fooled, Friday. He had the prison officials buffaloed, too. Yeah, I know. I helped convince them. You got any leads on Tyler at all, Grayson? I mean, from the time he broke prison? Pretty strange. They traced him as far as Stockton, then they lost the trail completely. The Stockton police in on the search? Yeah, sure. Funny. The guy has no money, no car we know of, no change of clothes. You figure he's getting help from somebody? Could be. Excuse me a minute. Brown speaking. Oh, just a moment. You Friday. Oh, thank you. Friday. Yeah. When? Uh, where? Uh, just a minute. Will you hold on, please? It's the Tyler's friends down at Laguna Beach. Mrs. Tyler there? No, she called him last night about 7 o'clock, told him she'd changed her plan. She wasn't coming. She told him where she was going? She wanted to know which highway would take her to Stockton. We told the Tyler's friends in Laguna Beach to contact us immediately if they heard from either Mr. or Mrs. Tyler. 
We got out an APB on Dorothy Tyler, and then we drove out to interview her relatives in Inglewood. They told us that Mrs. Tyler had the two children with her. She had left their house at 6 p.m. the night before by taxi. As far as they knew, she didn't own a car. We talked with some of her friends in the neighborhood. The only thing they could tell us was that she had not borrowed a car from any of them. We drove down to the telephone exchange where she was employed as an operator, and we spoke with a manager, a Mr. Ralph Cartwright. I'm sorry, gentlemen. This is Mrs. Tyler's night off. Is there something I can help you with? When is Miss Tyler due back to work, Mr. Cartwright? Well, she's working the uh, 10 to 7 starting tomorrow, due in at 10 a.m. Uh-huh. We understand that she's on a weekend vacation, huh? Yes. You see, today was payday, so she asked me if she could have her check ahead of time. Said she had to have the money for the weekend. Did you give her the check? Oh, my, no. I couldn't give her the check ahead of time. But I did do her a favor, just to help her over the weekend. What was that? I loaned her my car. <laughs> We got a complete description of the car together with a license number and called the office. The information was broadcast to all units throughout the city and teletyped to all points in the state. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown ordered an immediate stakeout on the telephone exchange where Mrs. Tyler was employed. The stakeout at the home of Inglewood continued. Another day passed. We checked with the bank where Mrs. Tyler maintained her account. It was 10.25 a.m. when we got back to robbery detail. Gentlemen, what'd you find out? Miss Tyler closed her account three days ago, withdrew all her savings, $46.55. Well, I'm not going to go far on that. Any word about that car she borrowed? Teletype came in about an hour ago. They found it just outside Santa Barbara, abandoned. Anyone see the Tylers? No reports. I wonder how those poor kids are making out. Yeah. He must be crazy, and his wife, too. If she was going to help him pull an escape, why'd she have to drag the kids along? That's the way some parents figure, Friday. They owe their children nothing. The children owe them everything. Call for you, Friday. Stay in, too. Oh, thanks, Larry. Friday. This is Hopkins, Friday, on stakeout, the phone exchange. Yeah, Bert. Tyler woman came for a check. We got her. Dorothy Tyler was brought into the city hall, where there was one of her children. He was delivered to the juvenile authorities for the time being. Mrs. Tyler was brought to the interrogation room. She refused to admit anything to the officers from the adult authority. She said she wanted to talk to me. I went in. She threw her arms around me and started crying. Joe! Joe, you won't let him get Max with you. You won't let him. I'm after him as much as they are, maybe more. Where is he? I can't tell you. Why'd you do it, Dorothy? Why? Oh, you know why, Joe. You know why I had to see him. I had to be with Max. It's a bum deal. You traded days for years. I can't get him. If I don't tell him where he is, they won't find him. They'll find him. He's got to eat, so do you and the kids. He has to go to work, and working with a gun is all he knows. He'll leave a trail. We'll find him. Jim, what have they done to the children? Where's Jimmy? They're taking care of him. That's more than you did. Where's your other boy, Vance? Max. Max has him. Oh, that's fine. You and Max ought to be real proud of yourselves. I had to see him. You know that. I had to see Max. Has he got a gun? Has he? Has he used it? No. He just thought he might need it. He hasn't hurt anyone. I swear it. You helped him escape, is that right? You helped him. He needed help. I met him at San Rafael. We drove all night. He didn't hurt anyone, Joe. He hasn't hurt anyone. Where is he now? Where is he? All right, Dorothy, we'll find him. Joe, if I tell you... If I tell you, will you go alone? I can show you the way. Will you go alone? Yeah. All right. I'll take you to him, Joe. I trust you. Yeah, I trusted him once, too. 5 p.m., Monday, April 25th. Dorothy Tyler, Ben, and I got in the car and headed north for the coast town of Santa Maria. Acting under orders of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown, Larry Thompson from Robbery Detail followed in another car. Holland and Grayson from the State Adult Authority were with him. It was ten minutes past eight when we drove through the town of Santa Maria. Just outside the city, Dorothy Tyler directed us to turn off onto a dirt road. We drove about two miles. She told us to pull up. Cross that field. Shacked by those trees. Lonely out here. I'll go with you, Joe. Maybe Max won't understand. Oh, uh, you stay here. Joe, that car. 
car stopped here. It's cops, Georgie. It had to be. They won't shoot unless Max does. But you promised. You said you'd go alone. I'll go alone. Friday? Hello, Grayson. Where is he? Should tell you? That shack over there across the field by that clump of trees. He's got one of the kids with him, that right? Yeah. He won't be any trouble. He's armed. The con's up at Quentin, so he won't be taken alive. They say he'll shoot it out. They talk a lot. You better let us take him. You're not getting paid to do for this one. I'll take him alone. I made a promise. That guy in the shack's in the habit of breaking promises. I keep mine. Keep an eye on Miss Tyler, will you, Ben? Thompson's watching her. I'm coming with you. I told her I'd go alone. There's two doors, front and back. Which one are you going in? Front. I'll be around back. Careful, Joe. Yeah. I'll be right back, Grayson. I started to cross the field. The shack was about 100 yards from the road. The field was uncultivated, and I wasn't sure of my footing. I stumbled over a tree stump. Halfway across the field, the lights in the shack went out. Who's that? Who is it? It's me, Max. Joe Friday. Max? Come on, open up. All right, Max. Why the gun, Joe? I never thought you'd take me with a gun. I never thought I'd have to kick down a door to get you. You've changed a lot, Max. How'd you find me, Dorothy? Tell you? Where is she? Outside. Your boy over there, Vance. He's sleeping. He's okay. Put out your hands. Put out your hands. I'm sorry, Joe. Yeah. You've been good to us. I won't try to explain. Neither will I, Max. Come on. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, city and county of Marin, state of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here are the actual figures. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. St. Louis Division. Fatima sales. Up 548%. Yes, in 1949, more and more smokers discovered that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. They found Fatima extra mild. They found Fatima has a much different, much better flavor. They found the name Fatima means the best in cigarette quality. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Tyler pleaded guilty to the charge of escape and was sentenced to the term as prescribed by law. He was returned to San Quentin and then transferred to Folsom Penitentiary, where he is now serving his sentence. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of our King Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the state of California and the men of the California Highway Patrol, another of America's outstanding law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Highway Patrol Commissioner Clifford E. Peterson, outstanding administrator and educator in the field of law enforcement, dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in the Halls of Ivy starting tomorrow on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes. 
best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Narcotics Bureau. A vicious criminal has resumed operations in your city. His profession, dealer in narcotics. You know his name. You know he's guilty. Your job, prove it. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers, coast to coast. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, January 21st. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Narcotics Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back into work, and it was 3.49 p.m. when I got to the main lobby of the city hall. Public phone booth. Hello? Oh, Ma, this is Joe. Joseph, you said you were going to be home at 4 o'clock. Oh, I couldn't help it, Ma. They changed the schedule. I, I got my stuff all right. Thanks for packing it. Well, I put your socks and your clean T-shirts on the bed. Did you put them in your bag? Yeah, I got them. Got them off the clothesline right after you called. They weren't quite dry, or I would have packed them for you. I got them all right. Listen, Ma, I'll call you whenever I get the chance. Now, don't worry. How long are you going to be gone? I haven't any idea. Maybe a month. All depends. How can I get in touch with you? You can't. Call Ben. He'll get the message to me somehow. Where is it you're going, Joseph? Well, I'm not going anyplace, Ma. I'll be right here in the city, but I just won't be able to come home for a little while. It's a special job. No, like the last time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you be careful now. Watch what you order when you're eating out in those awful restaurants. Yes. And get your rest. Yes, ma'am. You ma need plenty of rest. Yeah, okay, Ma. I'll be all right. I was shopping today. I bought a nice loin roast for dinner tomorrow night. Now you won't be here. Well, why don't you invite the neighbors over? The Newtons? That'd be good company for you. Yeah. Now, don't worry. If you want to get in touch with me, you deliver the message to Ben, okay? Yes. All right. What kind of work you be doing? You going to be dangerous? Oh, it's just another job, Ma. It'll work out. I'll call you when I can. All right, Joseph. And be careful now. Take care of yourself. Yeah, you too. Goodbye, Ma. Right, Joseph. Bye. I left the phone booth and started down the corridor. I went up a short flight of stairs and turned left. The afternoon crowd in the city hall seemed heavier than usual. I walked past the elevators and turned right down another corridor. It was 3.58 p.m. And I got to room 24, Narcotics Bureau. Captain Point? Hi, Joe. You want to take these? Yeah, sure. My badge. Okay. There's all my identification. And my gun. Right. I'll take care of them for you. These uh, clothes look all right? Just a minute. Now, let's see. Yeah. I don't like that tie. Romero. Yes, Gibber? Let's see your tie. Yeah, swap with Friday, will you, Ben? Oh, Christmas tie is pretty loud. Mine's not. That's the idea. Here. Here's some stuff to carry in your pocket. Social security card, ID card, all made out to Joe Kyber. Mm -hmm. uh, some book matches from St. Louis, a couple from Reno, Nevada. Okay. You pick up another gun? I loaned him my 25 automatic. It's small. It's easy to carry. Suit yourself. I don't have to tell you to be careful. No. 
It's a chance we've been waiting for, Joe. A lot depends on you. I'll do what I can. Just one thing I want to tell you. Take your time. Take all the time you need. Don't push it. I understand. No time limit. Your time's up when they find out who you are. Captain Lynn White and I left the Narcotics Bureau together with Ben and Johnny Bingham. We went down the hall to the office of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. As in most major narcotic cases, the plan involved the coordinated work of all three offices, the federal, state, and our own local bureau. The operation involved a great many men and a lot of time. When we got to the chief of detectives' office, two men were with him. Bill Craig, the agent in charge of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for the Southern California area, and Inspector Virgil Beckner, head of the State Narcotics Bureau for our district. All of us had one common goal, the apprehension and conviction of two men, Arthur Belmont and Ralph Costello. The first man on the list, Ralph Costello. Chief Brown outlined the overall plan. Craig, your federal men have been tracking Costello off and on for three years now. Bex will be your state agents. Same for our men. This time we can't afford to miss. You figure an undercover man working locally? Is that right, Chief? Yeah, Craig. You start right from the bottom, work up the line until he gets to Costello if he gets there. Beck? Where are you going to start? Uh, Kevin White, would you lay it out for Beck and Craig? Yeah. Friday here is going to handle the job. He's got his full instructions. Joe, you want to follow me? All right. I'll make my first contact tonight. I'll meet in a bar down on South Pico with another one of our undercover men, Benny Arredondo. He'll introduce me as Joe Kyber to one of his informants. The informant is supposed to help get me into the Flats gang. The same bunch running on the south end of town? Yeah, small-time peddlers. Be curious. A little bit of everything. Go on, Friday. When I get in the gang, I run with them until I find out where and how they make their buys. And after you get a contact, you make buys all the way up the line and get as close as you can to the top. Yeah, that's right. You worked out your contact with us? He knows that under no conditions will he be seen around the department here. It's been set up that... I have a hotel room lined up down on the east side. Romero here and Captain White will be my only contact with the office. I'll be using the name Joe Kyber. Sounds all right to me. How about you, Craig? How about that informant, Friday? Can you count on him? Arredondo thinks a lot of him. He says he's a good man. He's the first rung on the ladder. He's got to be solid. Well, if he's not, we won't have far to fall. Depends on how you look at it. You can kill yourself in the bathtub. 8 p.m. Thursday, January 21st. I checked in at the Casino Hotel on Terminal Street. I registered as Joe Kyber, Omaha, Nebraska. I was given the key for room five. The rent was $7 a week. I unpacked a few things I had in my bag and went down the hall and took a shower. I went down to the lunchroom on the corner. I had an egg sandwich and a cup of coffee. It was 11.18 p.m. when I walked into Blue Wright's Bar and Grill. I ordered a beer and sat down. I watched the missing persons program on the television set above the bar. Lose somebody, Kyber? Hello, Benny. Been here long? I just got here. Where's your boy? Sitting over there with that fellow in the blue suit. Name's Gene. Who is the guy in the blue suit? More of the Flats gang. Hmm. Gene's lining up your introduction now. Guy's name is Ludwig. I call him Lud. He knows me as Steve. Right. What do we do? Sit tight till Gene gives us the word. The tie yours looks like it's on fire. It'd look all right? I wouldn't wear it. Lud would. Get in the hotel, okay? Yeah, all set. Room five. Gene wants us. Let's go. Okay. Hi, Steve. See, your boy got here. Yeah. Gene, meet Joe Kyber. Hi. This is Lud. Joe Kyber? Lud. Sit down. You like the fights, Kyber? Yeah. They got nothing out here in that line. I used to go to the garden when I was east. They got some fine cards at the Legion. Where? Hollywood Legion. Friday night. Some classy looking fighters out there. Where is that? Out in Hollywood. Nice little stadium. Yeah. I'd like to go with you sometime. Tomorrow? I got a date. Maybe next week. Bring her along. A lot of women go. Not this one. Okay. Are you guys hungry? I could eat. Yeah. Joe? Sure. How about here? Nobody eats here. Well, steam table over there. This stuff smells pretty good. So does garbage if the wind's blowing the other way. Let's get a fresh dip sandwich, huh? How about Galbraith over on Sotelo? Okay. How about you guys? Sure. Well, let's go. All right. You from the east, Kyber? Omaha, Memphis, all around. Yeah. You don't talk very much. You do. You talk tough. Are you tough? Sometimes. This place we're going to go eat, sometimes the meat's tough, too. Yeah? Just like a piece of tough meat, you can always cut it down to size. 
The following week at the fights, I met some of the other members of the Flats gang. They were a typical group of hoodlums. Unlike fiction writers have portrayed them, generally gangs of this type do not operate under a gang leader. Each member considers himself the best of the lot. For all practical purposes, they didn't need a leader. But as in any group, some men are more dominant than others. Ludd was one of these. Because of his tough manner, I observed that the gang members placed confidence in Ludd. It was then that I decided that I had to be tougher than he was if the gang was going to accept me. Five weeks went by, March 7th. There was still no mention by any of them that they were either using or dealing in narcotics. Come on in, Carver. Sit down. Bud? Carver, meet Jerry's phone. Hi. I picked up the tickets for the basketball game tonight. Good seats? Yeah, they look okay. You got an extra, Doki? Maybe I tag along. Yeah, we got four. You look kind of sad, Carver. He always looks that way. First he was tough, now he's sad. Oh, you and that mouth. You know it all, don't you? No offense. You look a little low. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Carver, but I'm a little on the par. I'm going to have myself a pop. You interested? No, I don't use it. Why don't you try it? You might get a kick out of it. I have. It's all right going up, but it's nothing coming down. That's where you make a mistake. Stay up. Don't come down. Hell up. You heard what he said, Jerry. You don't like it. How does he know? He never stayed up long enough. Take your pop and shut up. You talk about Kaiba trying to be tough. You think you're the big wheel around here. That's enough. You ought to quit giving orders, Lud. You know better than the rest. Look, little man, knock off that kind of talk and keep us both happy. Sure, sure. The boss, man. You know, I got one positive way to shut you well, Why don't you two quit? This huh? concerns me and Phil. You keep your mouth shut. Well, don't get mad at me. I only wanted to save an argument. Can it, I see. Now, look, big mouth, you can push Phil around, but not me. Now you're playing the tough guy again, ain't you? Why don't you go over there and sit down, huh? You sit me down, punk. <laughs> All right, now listen to me, both of you. I'm tired of being talked down to like a junior member of the firm. You either treat me equal or leave me alone. You understand? <laughs> you had it coming, Lud. <laughs> yeah. I right, put that bottle down, Lud. Where'd you get that gun? You carry that thing right along? Right along. Put it down, Lud. Okay. I'm long on memory, Cabot. Remember that. Yeah, and I'm real short on patience with you. Well, I still ain't had my pop. <laughs> Better hurry. I don't want to miss the game. You got good seats, eh, Cabot? They're not too low. I can't see nothing if they're too low. Don't worry. You'll be high enough. Two months went by. By playing the tough guy, I gained a great deal of prestige in the eyes of the other gang members. Jerry Fell made sure that all the members heard about that episode up in Ludd's room. Dealers and users of narcotics rarely carry guns. The members of the Flats gang were small-time peddlers and users. They're referred to as mules or small fry. When they found that I carried a gun at all times, they were impressed. They considered me one of them. Since the very beginning of my undercover work, I met weekly with Ben Romero and Captain Lynn White of the Narcotics Bureau. I would be picked up at a different location each time, making sure that I wasn't followed, and we would remain in the car and drive around in a remote section of the city discussing my progress with the gang. During this first three-month period, under the pretext that I had clients to furnish, I made two small narcotics buys, one for $13 and one for $8. As soon as the purchases were made, I would mark them for identification, contact Ben, and then turn the narcotics over to him to be booked as evidence by the property clerk at Central Division. Another month went by. Thursday, June 5th, 11 p.m. We had just returned from the midget auto races, and we were sitting around in Ludd's room. You mentioned something out at the races, Carver. Now what's on your mind? I told you, Ludd, I need a half a dozen caps right away. I got people putting the bite on me. Old customers. How old can they be? You've only been out here five months, remember? When they're hooked, they get to be old customers in a month. I fixed up two buys with Morse for you. Tony says he can't handle anymore. Hasn't got enough around. You got on board late, you know. All of us are ahead of you. Tony can get more. Who's his source? A couple of guys. I know him. How about an office to one of them? You deal with Tony. You said he hasn't got enough. That's right, I did. Okay. How much do you want? They're your customers. What's it worth? They'll pay. What's the guy's name? Costello's one of them. He'll have enough for you. Who's the other guy? He'll deal with Costello for now. Where can I meet him? Morse will set it up for you. I got to meet him in an hour. Come in. Police officers. Shake it down, down the hall. What's the trouble? Checking for a robbery suspect. Find anything, George? Rose clean. We don't know anything about a heist. You'll have to come downtown and answer a few questions. What's the matter with you, fellow? You look like we spoiled your party. Yeah, you spoiled it.
You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima best in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of greater smoking enjoyment, buy Fatima in the appealing gold and yellow package. You'll agree, Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. The chance of my being picked up while working on an undercover assignment was one which all of us had considered, since only a handful of men out of some 5,000 working police officers in the department knew anything about our narcotics investigation. We knew that such an occurrence was not impossible. It's one of the chances we had to take. In this instance, we lost, and the critical meeting with one of the men we were after was forestalled. How long our detention at police headquarters would delay my meeting with Ralph Costello was anybody's guess. Could mean weeks or maybe months. I was booked on suspicion of 211 PC, robbery. So was Ludd. The next afternoon, I was taken from cell block 10D2 to the interrogation room. Come on in and sit down, Kyber. How are you, Friday? There's a tight squeeze. The booking number's been canceled, Joe. Prince been stopped. Those two men from robbery who pulled me in, Wynn and Donahoe. I thought, I thought I was in trouble for a minute. They had no idea you were in that room. Once they got up there, they had to follow through. Well, they played it right. They remembered their etiquette. If either one of them had said hello before you did, you might have been in big trouble. Well, I'm in big trouble anyway. I had a meet all set with Costello. Almost set, anyway. It's just a case of bad timing in that pickup, hmm? Huh? Well, if they'd have got there two hours later, it might have been different. Well, how do you stand now? How close are you to Costello? I need some more money. i got to pay off Ludd. And he'll take you to Costello if you pay the right price? Yeah. Ludd's working through Morris. You know about him. Remember, Friday, if there's any questions when you get back to that gang, you were booked for CCW. You're out on bail. Yeah. I got, I got you another gun, Joe. 32 automatic. Okay? Yeah, thanks. I couldn't go back with the same one. Uh, what about the federal and state men? How are they doing? Pretty good. Federal men picked up Costello in Fresno. He was connected with the sale of six cans of H. Mm-hmm. Not much heroin up there. No wonder Ludd can afford to hold me up. He knows there's a shortage down here. Case isn't too strong against him. When it looked definite that we had him, they were going to call you off. He's out on bail. Well, Costello's back down here now. Yeah. Seems like we get our hands on the guy, but we can't hold him. Narcotics in their possession are under their control. That's what the book says. That's the way we got to get him. We'll get him that way. It's up to you now, Friday. Stay with it and keep your chin covered. And if you need anything, Joe, call. Your mother's been over at the house for dinner a few times. She's okay. Thanks. Tell her I'm all right, will you? Sure. She worries a lot about you, Joe. Anything happened to you, just about kill her. That makes two of us. I'll see you. Before I left the city hall, Captain White drew out some more money from the Secret Service Fund. This fund is for the sole purpose of undercover work. This latest amount was for the narcotics buy that I hoped to make with Ralph Costello. An hour before I left, Ludd was released on a writ that he had arranged for. Saturday, June 7th, 9 a.m., I checked back into my room at the casino hotel. During the three weeks that followed, I kept asking Ludd to arrange a meeting for me with Tony Morse, the next man on the ladder on the way up to Costello. Ludd kept stalling me. Another week went by. Captain Lynn White, Ben, and I held our regular weekly meetings. On July 6th, Ludd told me that a meeting with Morse had finally been arranged for 8 p.m. that night. I called Ben and told him I'd meet him and the captain immediately after I talked with Morse. At 8 p.m., following the instructions Ludd had given me, I was in the downstairs waiting room at the subway terminal at 5th and Hill. I was told to wait for the apple vending machine. Excuse me, mister. Oh, yeah, sure. Kyber? Yeah, you Morse? Right, want an apple? No, no thanks. Well, then sit down. All right. Now, what'd you have in mind? I got a couple of hundred bucks to spend. Can you handle it? Who sent you? 
You know who sent me. Sure I do. I just want to hear you say it. Well, I'd... We can handle it. What'd you have in mind? I said $200 worth. That's 40 caps. We got it. None of that Mexican junk. I want European stuff. You bought before. You'll take what we got. That last buy I made through Lud, the junk was cut to nothing. You can only use so much milk and sugar, you know. By the time it got to you, it was probably cut pretty thin. So was the price you paid for it. I'm not looking for bargains. I pushed to good people. I want good stuff. You'll do better this time. You're not dealing with Lud. Sure, we cut it. No more than anybody else. Not as much as Lud. When can I get it? You got some sick people? A couple. Have it for you in an hour. Where's the meat? Got a watch? Yeah. What time you got? Twelve minutes after eight. Add a minute. Make it thirteen after. Okay. An hour from now. Nine thirteen. Meet Lud at Macy in Brooklyn on the corner. He'll tell you what to do. Will Lud have it? Meet Lud at nine thirteen. See you later, Kimer. Oh, wait a minute. How do I know you're leveling? How do we know you are? <laughs> out the front of the subway terminal building. I took a cab down to 7th and Main. I got off and walked into Pop Sherman's bar. I called the office and set up a meeting with Ben and the captain. I ordered a beer, paid for it, left my change in the bar, asked the bartender to watch it, told him I'd be right back. I went out the back way, crossed the alley, and got down to Los Angeles Street. I walked up to 9th and picked up a cab to take me to Fulton and Covina Avenue. I got out and walked two blocks. It was 8.41. Hi. You meet Morris? Yeah. Sure nobody tailed you? I took all the precautions. What's you said, Arthur? I'm not sure, and I don't have much time. I'm going to make the buy tonight. When? 9.13. You don't have much time. Kind of rushing it, aren't they? I figured I'd better play along. Who's going to meet with? Morris told me to meet Ludd at Macy and Brooklyn. Said that he'd carry it from there. Costello in on it? I don't know. You got it all. All right. We'll start picking up the flats, gang. Everyone but Ludd. What do you think? Well, the way I got it figured, Morris is Costello's runner. He checked me out, and as far as I could tell, he thinks I'm okay. Yeah. I got a hunch Lud's going to take me to either Morse again or Costello or possibly both. I don't know where the actual meet's going to be. That means a tail job. We'll have to pick you up at Macy in Brooklyn and stick with you until after Lud leaves, if he does, and follow through with you. Figure it wide, Skipper. Don't worry, I know we're close. What time you got, Romero? Mm, ten minutes to nine. Turn down the next block. Right. Pull up here, Ben. Okay. Here you go, Friday. Keep your chin covered. Yep. Hey. Hello, Phil. Friends of yours in the car? Why? I know them. They ain't friends of mine. I didn't say I knew them. I don't know the guy driving, but the other guy, I seen him lots. Just about four weeks ago, we all seen him. Huh? That fuzz, white, narcotics man. Oh, yeah. Well, they've been riding me since they picked me up with a gun. Won't do, cop. Narcotics men ain't got nothing on you. That was robbery, remember? They got a make on me from Nebraska. They, they've been on me ever since I got here. That figures. You're one of them. All right, look, Jerry. I'll argue with you later. I'm in a hurry. I got to meet Lud. I take along. I want to see Lud, too. You going to spill the Lud about what you think? Maybe. I think I owe it to him. I know him a lot longer than you. I know he ain't no cop. And you're sure that I am? I know you are. Let's see what Lud thinks. Yeah. All right, come on. On your feet. Get out. I looked at my watch. It was two minutes to nine. In 15 minutes, I had to meet Lud. I had to hit Jerry Fell. I couldn't take the chance of him getting to Lud before I did. I couldn't leave him. I couldn't take him with me. I pulled him to his feet and half dragged and half carried him two blocks before I spotted a patrolman. Hey, officer. Officer, over here. Yeah, what's the trouble? I'm Friday, Central Narcotics. Yeah. Take this man and get him downtown. Contact Chief Brown. He'll identify me. Serial number 2288. Friday, Narcotics. The suspect's name here is Jerry Fell. You got it? Yeah, you got some kind of identification? No, I haven't. Not a thing. It's a special duty. I'm sorry. I don't know you. I have to hold you till I call in. All right, but hurry, huh? Call box right here. This is Carlson, box 117. Check on a matter with the chief of detectives, Brown, will you? Yeah, that's right. I have a man here who identifies himself as Friday. Uh, what's your first name? Joe, Joe Friday. Tell him to hurry. Yeah. Joe Friday, Central Narcotics, serial number 2288. Says he's in a hurry, holding a suspect, Jerry Fell. I'll hold on. Hey, my watch says five after nine. What time you got? I got uh, six minutes after. It might be a little fast. Any cab stands around here? Four blocks up the street. Which way? That way. Yeah. Okay, I will. Thank you. Okay, Sergeant. Sorry to hold you up. Need any help? No, you just hang on to this guy. Don't let him go. I started to run. Macy in Brooklyn. Six blocks away, and I had eight minutes to make it. A narcotics buy is one date you're not late for. Either you're there at the specified time, or there's no deal. 
The veteran narcotics peddler knows that that's the only safe way for him to operate. A minute, one way or the other, could mean an arrest. I ran. You're out of breath, Kyber. Anything wrong? No, the cab broke down. I didn't want to be late. Yeah, you got 40 seconds. That's cutting it pretty thin, but it'll do. Come on. All right. Right here. By this lamppost? I'd sit right in front of it. Don't move to the left or right. Stay put. They'll handle the rest. So long. Get in, Kyber. Got the money? Right here. Hmm. Yeah, Two hundred. Here's your package. Okay. That's it. Joe Kyber, meet Ralph Costello. Hi. Hello. Out this side, Kyber. Okay. I'll see you. Did you make the buy Friday? Yeah, take them. Hi, Joe. Ben, thought you were with the captain. They don't need me. That intersection's blocked off up there. They're pulling them over right now. See? Yeah. Uh-huh, they got them. Costello in the car? Yeah. And that's half of the team. Now what? We go after the big man, Arthur Belmont. Took us seven months and four days to get to Costello. Lots of time. Yeah. Always seems to work out that way, doesn't it? What's that? They always run out of time before we do. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 6th at 10.45 p.m., Ralph Costello was taken to the Narcotics Bureau, the interrogation room. In a moment, the results of that interrogation. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. They find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. With the promise of the United States District Attorney that his prison terms for the possession and sale of narcotics would run concurrently rather than consecutively, Ralph Costello agreed to furnish us vital information concerning the number one narcotics dealer on the Pacific Coast, Arthur Belmont. Next week, the big man, Arthur Belmont. have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in the Halls of Ivy tomorrow evening on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. Your 
detective sergeant. You're assigned to Narcotics Bureau. For seven months, you've been working with federal and state agents in breaking a narcotics ring. You've apprehended the small fry. Next in the line, the big man. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, July 9th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Narcotics Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work, and it was 3.58 p.m. when I got to room 24, Narcotics Bureau. Hi, Joe. Feel better? Well, I'm not quite as tired, Ben. The Costello thing was a long haul. Narcotics Romero. Okay, Bigham. I'll tell him. Meeting's in five minutes. Chief Brown's office. Okay, I want to pick up my stuff from the captain first. Hi, Skipper. Come on in. A little better Friday. Get some rest. Yeah, and a couple of good meals. That's the trouble with the Flats gang. They never know where to eat. Sit down, Joe. I want to talk to you. We got a couple of minutes before the meeting. You'll probably be getting this all up and down the line from here in. Just want to let you know that we think you and all the men in the operation did a fine job. My part wasn't much. You did more than I did. Oh, we all worked, but you had the dirty end of it. Good job. Here's your equipment. You'll need it now. Oh, yeah, thanks. Badge, your ID card, your gun, six shells, that's all of it, huh? Mm-hmm. That's it, thank you. You're back at it. Yep. Here's one for you. Look at this. What's that you got? Mug shot of a girl picked up in a narcotics raid last night. Oh, a pretty girl. Long, blonde hair, beautiful eye. Mm-hmm. She looks young. High school girl? She was when that picture was taken, 1947. She was 16. Here, look at this one. Yeah. Same girl. Yeah. That's the way she looked at 11.30 last night when we picked her up. She looks 50. 19 years old. Three years on heroin. She might as well be dead. She is. 8 o'clock this morning. Let's go. It's time for the meeting. You just looked at the best reason I know of for getting Belmont. Did she get her stuff from Belmont? Costello was pushing to her. He got his stuff from Belmont, the old one. Romero, let's go. All right, William. Anybody to brief you on the Costello interview, Joe? No, no, not yet. Chief Brown will fill you in. Here we are. Chief? Gentlemen, come on in. You uh, men all know each other. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hiya, Craig. Uh, Captain White, I think you and your men know Policewoman Caswell. Yes, sir. How are you, Florence? Hello. I'm Ms. Caswell, Inspector Virgil Beckner, State Narcotics. How do you do? Oh, yeah. Bill Craig, agent in charge, Federal Narcotics. Hello. How do you do? Before we get into the Belmont procedure, let's see how we stand on the Costello case. Uh, Why do you want to fill everybody in on information we got from Ralph Costello? Yes, sir. Uh, after his arrest Monday night, we interrogated Costello for about four hours. We confronted him with the package he sold to Friday here. How the stuff test? Crime lab ran it through about a third of an ounce of heroin, fair quality Mexican stuff. The man we picked up with Costello, Tony Morris, was questioned as well. He corroborated Costello's story. <clears throat> What'd you get from him? Well, he told us he had a great deal of information on the big man in the operation, Belmont. He said he wouldn't tell us a thing unless we made a deal with him. What kind of a deal? <laughs> he wanted everything. But we finally agreed that the only thing we might possibly work out was his prison term. Mm-hmm. We called in the U.S. District Attorney. We talked another four hours. How'd it work out? District Attorney told Costello the only thing he'd do for him was to have his prison terms run concurrently rather than consecutively. Not much to pay for what we got. Costello mm-hmm. gave us enough to enable us to start moving on Belmont right away. We've had his M.O. confirmed. We've got a list of most of his pushers. Now we can get to him. Any definite plan, Chief? 
Oh, White and I have been talking over here with Craig and Beck. We worked out what we think might be a pretty good plan. Uh, Craig, do you want to lay out how your men are going to handle it from the federal end? We'll work from out of town to the center here. We'll check his contacts across the state lines. We've already traced his connections to the east, New York syndicate. We'll keep working that end. Beck, uh, how about your state narcotics men? We'll work inside the state line here. We've already checked out part of his operations. We've <clears> located <throat> sources in San Francisco, Bakersfield, Fresno, as far south as San Diego, Lower California. We'll draw all those ends up tight. Keep moving. You fellows can both give us a hand if we need assistance. You bet. Yeah, that's right. Fine. Uh, White, what are we going to do locally? Oh, it's going to be a case of taking what we know and finding out what we don't know, putting the two together. Seems to me to be a case of watching the man at all times. Belmont shouldn't be able to blow his nose without one of our men knowing it. It's going to be a tremendous undertaking. You all know the tough job it is shadowing narcotics, man. They're fidgety, hypersensitive. They recognize anything out of the ordinary at once. Well, for that reason, it can't be a one-man operation. Everybody's got to work it. Our undercover won't work this time. They're no doubt alerted. So we'll work it from another angle. When do we start? We've already started. Belmont lives in Manhattan Beach. His house is under surveillance. Has been since yesterday. Well, I can't impress upon all of you the importance of not letting Belmont out of your sight for an instant. A narcotics buy could be made in 30 seconds. If we're not there at the instant, we lose him. Do we have anything at all as to when he might be ready to deal again? Nothing. Nobody seems to know Belmont's exact operating time. Could be any time. And in order to prosecute him, we've got to be there when the narcotics are in his possession or under his control. So we start to live with him and stay as close as we can without being tabbed until there's a buy. That's it. Captain White has all the assignments for our local men. Okay. We'll watch him. We'll stay close to him. If he makes a move, be there. The meeting lasted four hours. During that four hours, a plan was formulated which we hoped would end in the successful apprehension of the number one man in Pacific Coast narcotics traffic, Arthur Z. Belmont. How do you watch a man, his every move, for 24 hours, day in, day out, without his knowing it? How do you watch a man whose very existence depends upon not being watched, who is expertly schooled in every trick and device of police surveillance, whose method of operation will change with the slightest disturbance of his daily routine, and if that M.O. changes, you've lost him. Thursday, July 10th, in the small Los Angeles suburb of Manhattan Beach, population 10,172, three very ordinary events took place. A public nurse began a house-to-house survey. She asked the simple question, have you ever been vaccinated for smallpox? She started canvassing 27 blocks from the home of Belmont. Policewoman Florence Caswell. Two Japanese gardeners new to the city of Manhattan Beach began soliciting work. They started asking for jobs 38 blocks from the home of Belmont. Sergeant Ten Fujikuni and Patrolman John Kagawa. A team of surveyors driving a station wagon marked with the seal of Los Angeles County began taking linear measurements for the proposed enlargement of storm drains in the area. They started 14 blocks from the home of Belmont. Lieutenant John Bigham, Central Narcotics, Sergeant Ben Romero, and myself. Okay, Ben, bring in the rod. Let's knock off for lunch. What do you want to eat, John? In the wagon. Better take the transfer with us. Kids might pick it up. Yeah, I got it. I can't keep the sand out of my shoes. Might as well get used to it. We're a long ways from home. Yeah. Nine years on the job is the first time I ever brought my lunch in a paper sack. Who knows, Joe? This might change your whole way of living. Oh, you bet. You want to sit in the front? No, I'm getting back. Fellas, have a look at the local paper? No, I... Manhattan Beach Sentinel, down the bottom of page one in the box. Read it. Yeah, let me see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's good. What is it, Joe? Read it out loud. Well, it says, preliminary work on storm drains started. Surveyors. Well, it goes on to say that surveyors have started taking measurements for the new drains. Mm-hmm. Captain White's idea had the story planted. even got a release from the planning commission. Well, it won't hurt us a bit. Well, you said lunchtime. I've got enough here for the whole department. Four hard-boiled eggs. See what kind of sandwiches I drew. Deviled egg. Look here. She even put them on egg bread. I hate eggs. Mm, looks like the captain driving up the street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's him. Driving a city car. Chief engineer. How's it going, Biggin? All right. Slow. How's your lunch? What do you got? Deviled egg sandwiches. Got plenty. Can't stand them. How about a ham and cheese? Yeah, thanks. There you go. Hmm. How's everybody else doing? Hmm. Very slow. Takes time. Got to keep taking our time. If we tip it before we got close enough, Belmont's on his way. Mm-hmm. 
How long are we going to have to keep our distance? Not much longer. We can't take a chance of starting everybody out right on top of Belmont. Uh -huh. It might look funny to him. Anybody else would be okay. The average person, your operations might look normal, but we can't afford to try to get it by Belmont that way. Mm. With a hop cutter, you never know. It's not so much that we don't know. We just can't take any kind of a chance. Mm. That's what I mean. He might have started right on Belmont's front lawn, and he's never got wise. But we wouldn't want to risk it. Belmont been out of his house today? He's on the go quite a bit. Left his house at 9.13 a.m., went down to the shop right market, bought a half pound of bacon, two dozen eggs, loaf of bread, whole wheat. Sergeant Hodges waited on him. He's clerking in the grocery department. Oh, yeah. Then he drove over to his neighborhood gas station, got a full tank of ethyl and two quarts of oil, 30 weight, drove home, got back at 9.42. Are you still there? Yeah. About time you guys were back at it, huh? Right. Okay, Ben. You want to grab some of the gear? Yeah. I guess. Let's go. Hey, Joe. Mm -hmm. Give me a leftover bread crust, will you? I'll give them to Seagull. Yeah, sure. Here you go. Yeah. Well, foot by foot, we're getting closer to Belmont. Hope nobody tips it. Nobody should, unless you don't trust those gulls. We surveyed the city of Manhattan Beach for five weeks. Policewoman Caswell, posing as a nurse, continued canvassing. Everybody concerned with the job of standing watch over Arthur Z. Belmont carried out their routine day by day. Daily reports came in from everyone in the operation. These reports would be sifted at Central Narcotics and progress reports compiled for the use of those in the field on the Belmont case. All police cars, as well as city cars, such as we were employing, were equipped with three-way radio communication. All personnel were in constant contact with one another. Wednesday, August 12th, it was the decision of Captain Lynn White that the idea of our posing as city surveyors had been exhausted. Further use of this could possibly arouse suspicion. Belmont lived at 1227 Ocean Avenue. Two days before we were called off the surveying job, the city leased the private residence at 1216 Ocean Avenue. A van load of furniture was moved in. Drapes and curtains were hung. Regular deliveries of daily newspapers and milk were made to the house. To all outward appearances, the house was occupied by an average family. Actually, it provided another blind from which we could continue to observe Belmont. Shortwave radio equipment was installed in an upstairs room. Ben and I were assigned the night watch. Another car just stopped in front of Belmont's house. How many does that make? Three cars. Just a minute. Yeah. A couple of guys getting out. Point up the front door. Mm. Where? Let me see, huh? Take a look. Watch curtain. Uh huh. Yeah. Belmont answered the door. He's letting him in. Something's doing. What do you think? I don't know. You called Captain White, didn't you? Oh, an hour ago. Just after the first car pulled up. He'll park in the alley and come up the back way. Yeah, I better check with everybody again. This portable seemed to warm up slower than our car radio. Mm, about the same. Ah, here we go. Unit 140K to Unit 145K. 145K, go ahead. Just checking. Your location the same? That's right. Ocean Clipper. We got three cars to cover now. Stand by. Roger. Unit 140K to 143K. 143K, we got it. Standing by. Location still good? Same. Be talking to you. Stand by. 140K to 149K. 149K, go ahead. Stay put. We got three cars now. Yeah, we heard the same spot. Stand by. Roger. Captain, just pulled into the alley, Joe. Don't worry. Good. Belmont's porch light just went out. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Three guys came in the first car. Two in the second. Two in the third. Is that right? Yeah. Seven all told. Eight counting Belmont. Maybe he's running for office. Joe, Ben, any changes since you called me? Another car. Mm -hmm. Anybody you know? I'm too dark to see their faces. Mm-hmm. Dodge Coop, Gray... Black packet sedan, green cherry. Well, that might be for me. I told the office they could reach me here. Yeah. White. Yeah, Bigham. You must be wrong. You sure he's not lying? All right, thanks. Yeah. You sure Belmont hasn't left his house since you came on duty? Couldn't possibly. Not without somebody in the detailed spot, He got out somehow. He made a buy. Captain White called the office and talked to Benny Arredondo, our narcotics undercover man. He confirmed the fact that somehow Belmont had a meet and successfully completed a narcotics transaction. 
None of us could figure how, and we didn't know when the meet took place. Arredondo told us that the buy had been made sometime in the past ten hours. The arresting officers had recovered a portion of the narcotics, two bindles of heroin. They were found in the possession of one of Belmont's runners, Archie Scott. I can't figure it. What do we do now, Skipper? Sit tight and watch those three cars in front of Belmont's house over there. Maybe he didn't have to leave the house to make a buy. That's the way I got it, Peg. Those cars down there, those are the first visitors he's had in the past 24 hours? As far as anybody knows, we watched it close. Sometimes it's like that. Uh-huh. It looks like somebody's coming out over there. Two guys. How many in there? Eight, counting Belmont. All right, Friday. Get to the cars. Yeah. They start to move out yet? No. Five, six, seven. That's all of them. They're heading to the car. Yeah. Looks like a three-way switch. We'll see when they start to move out. Attention, all units and special details. Stand by. Here's the license numbers, Joe. Oh, good. I need those things. Green Chevy's headed south. Black package going north. So's a Dodge Coupe. Uh Uh-huh. Dodge turn left at the corner. It's headed east now. Got it. 140K to all units and special detail. Unit 149K. 149K, go ahead. 1946 Green Chevrolet Sedan, license 61 William 852, headed south on Ocean. Roger. Unit 145K. 145K, go ahead. 1947 Gray Dodge Coupe, license 1X Ray 1898, headed east on Clipper Street. Roger. 143K, come in. 143K, yep. 1939 Black Packard Sedan, license 6 Mary 6778, headed north on Ocean. Roger, got him spotted. Could be a dry run, couldn't afford to chance it either way. Nothing to do now but wait it out. That's right, and pray for rain. It was eight minutes past 8 p.m. We sat back and waited for the reports to come in from the cars. At 8.25 p.m., 17 minutes after the alert was broadcast, Unit 149K reported in on the gray Chevrolet sedan. The car and its occupants were thoroughly searched. No trace of narcotics was found. 8.42 p.m., 34 minutes after the alert. Unit 143K to 140K. 143K, go ahead. On that 1939 package sedan, license 6, Mary 6778. Shook them down. Nothing. They're clean. 8.50 p.m., 42 minutes after the alert, the report on the third and final car came in, the 1947 gray Dodge Coupe. That's it. Not a trace of narcotics in any of those three cars. Belmont beat us. Tough luck. It's going to be tougher. Now he knows we're after him. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima best in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of greater smoking enjoyment, buy Fatima in the appealing golden yellow package. You will agree... Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. The three car switch. Three cars arrive at a given point at different times. The meet takes place. The drivers of the various cars leave the given point at the same time. Each drives away from the point in a different direction, making it three times as difficult to follow them. The practice was not new to the Narcotics Bureau or the dealers in narcotics. It usually includes the dry run in which the actual mechanics of the narcotics are carried out, but neither the merchandise nor the money is on hand. This practice forces the narcotics officer into pure guesswork. If the officer doesn't follow up, the buy could be successful. If he chooses to follow up, he takes the chance of exposing himself and tipping his hand on a rehearsal. In the case of this particular car switch, we lost. But taken in the car roundup were seven of Belmont's trusted runners. Six of these men refused to talk, but the seventh, Clifford Bissell, gave us a lead to one of Arthur Belmont's most trusted friends. His name was Floyd Ketchell. 
He and his wife lived at 357 Evergreen Drive, Linwood. It's a nice house. Yeah. Yes? Uh, police officers, we'd like to ask you a few questions. What about? Well, as you probably know, there's been a series of burglaries here in your neighborhood. No, I didn't know. Oh, yes, quite a few. Uh, would you mind if we came in and talked to you about it? I don't know anything about any robberies around here. Everything's okay. This is just a routine check, Mr. Ketchell. Everybody else in the neighborhood's cooperating. Only take just a minute. All right, you can come in, but I have to leave in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Well, you have a nice place here, Mr. Ketchell. Yes. Now, what was it you wanted me to help you with? You know a man by the name of Clifford Bassell? No. How about Arthur Z. Belmont? Who? Arthur Z. Belmont. Bassell says you and Belmont are good friends. I don't understand this. I thought you wanted to ask me about some robberies. I wonder if you'd mind rolling up your left sleeve. I'd like to look at your arm. What for? You're a user, aren't you? No, I'm not. Then you know what we're talking about, don't you? No, I don't. Do you have any narcotics here in the house? Certainly not. You mind if we look around? Why do you want to search the house? Why won't you show us your left arm? Floyd Ketchell would admit nothing, but he allowed us to search his home and grounds. An extra detail of men was called out to aid us in the search. We covered every foot of the acre of ground. This took two days. We found nothing. On the third day, under the flooring of an upper bedroom of the Ketchell home, we found Ketchell's plant. He was using heroin. You want me to call Belmont, is that the idea? That's right. We want you to set up a meet with him. I'm not going to rat on Art. He's a friend of mine. Well, suit yourself. We found your plant there. We've got you. You'll be the fall guy. You mean I take all the heat? Why not? The cell put the finger on you. we got to have somebody. Why pick on me? We just told you. We found the stuff here. The cell fingered you. You're it. All you have to do is make a phone call. You won't have a clean slate, but it's going to sound a lot better in court. All right. It makes sense. You know what to tell him. We've already been over all that. Call him now. Friday, listen in on the extension. If Ketchell changes his mind in the middle of the conversation, I'll see that he hangs up. Yeah. Ketchel. Hiya, Ketch. Fine. How's Edna? She's fine, Art. Say, I got a friend on his way to Honolulu. Uh Uh-huh. He wants to take a little package along. Gotta have it. You know him? Is he okay? Yeah. Old friend. You sure? Yeah. Have to be pretty careful. Got hit Wednesday night down the beach. Yeah? Who'd they get? The cell and uh, six guys from New York. Got off easy. It was a dry run. I didn't know that. Nothing in the papers. Hasn't hit yet. It will. How much do your friend need? Going to be in the islands for quite a while, says a couple ounces should do it. You got the money now? He's good. Can you swing it tonight? Boat leaves from San Francisco day after tomorrow. He hasn't got much time, has he? Okay, you want to pick it up? Yeah. Uh, all right, if I bring him along, I want you to meet him. Good customer. Are you sure about him? Yeah. 8.30 at the store. We'll be there, Art. 1100 cash. Yeah. Better be okay, Ketch. He is. Better be. I had one dry run this week. I can have another. <laughs> 3.22 p.m. We took Mr. and Mrs. Floyd Ketchell back to Central Division where they were booked on suspicion of violation of the State Narcotics Act. 4 p.m. We met in the office of Chief of Detective Thad Brown. You need $1,100, is that right? Yeah, that's right. How much was in the Secret Service fund? $223. Allotment for this month's all gone. Well, where'd you get the rest of it? Haven't got it all yet. Romero's the banker. How you got it figured, Ben? Well, let's see. I've got it all written down here. I'm... First off, we got $223 cash. And these fellas all gave us their personal checks. Jack Donahoe and Robert gave us $200. Johnny Begum put up $100. And Captain White's in for $150. Joe put in $35 bucks and $22 is all I can swing. That's uh, $720. You need $380, right? Yeah, that's the way I got a figure. Okay, I think I can make up the rest. How about Wynn's Cadillac? He loaned it to you? He's out getting it washed. It's 41 isn't it? Yeah, sedan. A little old, but it looks good when it's washed. Flashy. Oh, that's what you need. You gonna make the buy away? Yeah. Ketchell will be with me. Okay. It's so all here. Eleven $1, hundred dollars. Yeah, we've only got one hitch. It's five o'clock and the banks are closed. Yeah? Not much time to run around getting checks cashed. It was five PM. We had three hours to cash seven hundred and twenty dollars in personal checks. We split up and covered every possible place in the city where we were known and where we knew they would cash them. By seven forty five PM we had the eleven $1, hundred in cash. The serial number on each bill was listed and the money turned over to Captain White. The scene of the meet was a hardware store on East 9th Street, which Belmont used as a front. Belmont's hardware was located in a small neighborhood shopping district. On Friday nights, the stores remained open until 9 p.m. 
Promptly at 8.30, Captain White and Floyd Ketchell pulled up in front of the store and went in. Ben and I waited in our car a half a block down the street. It was 8.35. There they are. They're coming out. Must have made to buy. Starting the car. Here they come. Watch for the skipper's signal, huh? Yeah. There it is. Let's go. Okay, pull over here. Come on. There's a clerk back there. You see Belmont? No. Can I help you? Uh, Mr. Belmont around? No, sir. He just stepped out. You sure? Yes, sir. He went out the back door not a minute ago. Bigham and Cassidy are out there, aren't they? <clears throat> yeah, he won't go for them. Oh, there's Mr. Belmont. Mr. Belmont, these gentlemen want to see you. He's running up the stairs to Mesne. Come on. All right, Belmont. Wait a minute. Watch that barrel. Watch it. Look out. Pushing that barrel down the stairs. Let's go. Come on. There he is. He's trying to reach that skyline. Belmont, get on. You'll never make it. He's slipping, Joe. Belmont! Come on. He didn't do that showcase any good. Yeah. He's through. Piece of that glass. Right through him. It's a rough way to go, and yeah. At least narcotics didn't kill him, didn't it? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December tenth, nineteen forty-eight, trial was held in Superior Court, Department eighty-seven, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. They find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. Twelve members of Arthur Z. Belmont's narcotics gang were finally rounded up by federal, state, and local authorities. All 12 were tried and convicted of violating the Harrison Act and the State Narcotics Act. They received sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their terms in state and federal penitentiaries. You have just heard Dragnets, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in Halls of Ivy tomorrow on NBC. have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. Two armed bandits have robbed a large jewelry store in your city. One of the suspects escapes. One is apprehended. He's identified as a friend of yours. Your job, send him to prison. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, 
superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, February 8th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way over from the city hall, and it was 8.35 p.m. when I got to the second floor of the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Treatment room. Joe, hi. Hi, Doc. Ben, how's it going? Okay. It hurt for a while. Doc gave me an injection. Six of a grain of morphine, Novocaine injection. Bullet still in your shoulder? Doc's about ready to take it out. As soon as I get the wound cleaned, here's the soap and water nurse. Alcohol sponge, please. How's it look, Doctor? Well, there's the x-ray, shallow penetrating wound in the deltoid area. Mm-hmm. Slugs, larger than the soft tissue right here. Oh, yeah. No bone involvement. Okay, the bullet was spent. That's good. Feel okay? Sure. Nurse, methylate applicators, please. Thanks. Let's see now. Where'd you leave Tyler, Joe? Interrogation room. Reynolds and Thompson are with him. Let me have the probe, nurse. Yeah. Feel anything, Romero? No. That's it. You hear that? Hear what? Located the slug with a probe. Oh. Nice. Close it. Thanks. There we go. Oh, steady. You call your wife? No, she don't know where I... Kind of watch out for him, huh? Give him a break, Joe. It's not their fault. You do it, Joe? Yeah. Sure, I'll take care of it. Now, you do something for me. Anything you want, guy. Let's have the straight story. Who was the guy with you on that hold-up this afternoon? Cresta, George Cresta, you know him. Out of Folsom, short guy, black hair? Yeah, yeah, he's got a room above the Red Owl Bar down on East 3rd near Broadway. That's where he hangs out. Where can we find Cresta now? Oh, maybe there, I don't know. I'll give you a list of the places he goes. Some of his friends I've met. He sure wrote me in. Said there wasn't going to be any rough stuff. You were carrying an S&W 38? Sure, sure. When they got outside the jewelry shop, Cresta jammed the gun in my hand. I had to put it away, get it out of sight. Believe me, Joe, he roped me into this. It sounds like an alibi. No, this but is I your could... second time around, Max. It sounds like one. Okay, I got nothing coming. Don't forget about Dorothy and the kids. Huh? I promised you. Now, you want to give me a full statement on the holdup now? Anything you say, Joe. I'll call for a stenographer. Joe. Yeah. I'm sorry. I am. I believe you. You got the feeling too late, that's all. <laughs> Max Tyler was arraigned in municipal court two days later. Bail was set at $10,000. Three days after that came his preliminary hearing in municipal court. At his arraignment in superior court, five weeks after he'd been apprehended, Tyler entered a plea of not guilty. A date was set for his trial in superior court. Meantime, the hunt for George Cresta, Max's accomplice, went on. There wasn't a sign of him. Our informants had no lead on him, and the all-points bulletin containing all the information we had on Cresta brought in nothing. On Monday, March 22nd, the trial of Max Tyler was held in Superior Court. Ben and I were subpoenaed to appear. The victim of the holdup, the jewelry store manager, was the first to testify. He was questioned by both the prosecutor and the counsel for the defense. He left the stand at 11.25 a.m. If it please, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Before the next witness testifies, I'd like permission to approach the bench. Permission granted. The prosecution may also put... wonder what that's all about, Joe. Something's up. Hello. Hmm? Judge is shaking his head. Public defender's going back to the counsel's table. Uh, counsel for the defense. Your Honor, it's my client's desire to change his plea to guilty. Oh. The defendant rise and face the court. <laughs> Max Tyler, is that your true name? Yes, Your Honor. On the 12th day of March of this year, in Superior Court, Department 83, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California, 
You have heretofore been arraigned on the charge of robbery in the first degree. At that time, you pled not guilty to the charge in question. Is it now your desire to change that plea? Yes, sir, it is. You've reached this decision of your own free will? Yes, I have. There's been no force employed, no promise of gratuity or reward to induce you to reach this decision? No, sir. Counsel for the prosecution. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> Max Tyler, on the 12th day of March of this year in Superior Court, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California, you are arraigned on the charge of robbery in the first degree. <coughs> that time you entered a plea is set forth in this information. How do you now plead? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is it stipulated that at the time of the commission of the robbery, the defendant was armed with a deadly weapon to wit a revolver? So stipulated. Court can fix his degree of robbery at robbery the first degree. Your Honor, in the interest of justice, the people moved to dismiss count two, assault with a deadly weapon. At this time, Your Honor, the defendant weighs time for sentencing and asks that he be sentenced immediately. Just a moment. <coughs> Max Tyler, it's the judgment of this court. But on the 8th day of February of this year, you did enter the premises at 23108 East Main Street in the city. <clears throat> and there did attempt the felonious taking of personal property in the possession of another from his person in immediate presence and against his will. Further, said attempt was made while you were armed with a dangerous and deadly weapon. <laughs> Tyler, this court finds you guilty of robbery in the first degree. Count two is dismissed. Does it, Joe? The decision of this court is to be returned to the county jail. The sheriff will transfer you to the state penitentiary where you will serve the sentence as prescribed by law. The court is set for 15 minutes. Hey, Joe. Miss hmm? Tyler over there. She's taking it pretty hard. Yeah, come on. We better go see her. Hello, Dorothy. I love him, Joe. What am I going to do without him? Children. I'll give it to you straight, Dorothy. You didn't do much to keep Max out of this. You drank right along with him. You don't Joe, deserve those kids. That's my opinion. Please, I know it. Don't make it any harder. Don't. I'll do anything I can for the kids, Dorothy. That's all. What am I going to do without him? I can't be all alone without Max. It's not right. It's not right. Neither is armed robbery. Goodbye, Dorothy. Before the end of March, Max Tyler was delivered to San Quentin State Penitentiary where he started serving his term. His wife, Dorothy Tyler, got a job as a telephone operator. She and her children continued living with their relatives down in Inglewood. I helped them out whenever I could. Six months went by. Every two weeks, faithfully, Tyler wrote me a letter from prison. I answered most of them. While Ben and I worked on other jobs, the search for George Preston went on. We failed to uncover a single lead. Ten months passed. Tuesday, January 16th, 1949, 4 p.m. I checked in for work as usual. Hi, Joe. Cold out, huh? Yeah. Did you pick up the mail? Mm-hmm. There's a letter in your box from San Quentin. Tyler, huh? How's he doing, anyway? Good. Clean record. Got himself a pretty fair job in the prison library. Yeah. I talked to the warden up there. Says Tyler ought to be eligible for parole in about a year if he keeps his nose clean. You going to bat for Tyler again? I don't know. See what happens. How can you see anything in that guy? He's giving you nothing but trouble. Oh, a lot of people are giving him the same. Maybe that explains it. Not for me, it doesn't. I wouldn't trust him with dirty laundry. I get it. Robbery Friday. Oh, Joe. Miss Dorothy Tyler. I got to talk to you. Yeah, Dorothy. What's the matter? I found Crestus. I saw him. What? George Crestus. I know where he is. I saw him downtown. I followed him to his place. You sure it was him? I'm positive. He's staying at 134 Jesse Street. It's a rooming house just off Alameda. One, three, four, Jesse. Got it. Thanks, Dorothy. Come on, Ben. Eight minutes later, Ben and I were interviewing the landlord at 134 Jesse Street, a cheap rooming house down on the south end of the city. The landlord's name was Peterson. We showed him Crest's mug shot, and he told us he was in room 11. We went up a dark, narrow stairway to the second floor. Stand clear. I'll try the door. Mm -hmm. It's open. Yeah. Joe, have a look. He's asleep. Yeah, he's passed out. Come on, slip the cuffs on him. That was easy. Yeah. All right, I got his gun. He's been drinking all right. He'll have a big hangover. He'll have a long time to get over it. 
George Cresta was booked at county jail on suspicion of robbery. Two months and three weeks later in Superior Court, he was tried and convicted of assault with a deadly weapon and first-degree robbery and sentenced to the state penitentiary. The day after Cresta was sentenced, I was called to the office of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. Friday, this Max Tyler is coming up for parole in a couple of months. He's a friend of yours, isn't he? That's right, in a way. You've been writing letters to the warden. you talked to the parole board about him. Understand you're helping on his kids. A few presents. They haven't had much of a break. They're just youngsters. Mm, working hard to get Tyler's parole. You think he's worth it? Well, I was off both him and his wife, and, and then she gave us that tip about Cresta, and Tyler's got such a good record up at Q, I figured they'd earned another chance. You're sticking your chin out, Joe, helping a con to get a parole. I think you'll realize that. Well, I believe he's a good risk now, Chief. He's pretty weak in some things. He needs direction, that's all. His wife's getting better. She might help more than she did. I hope both of them are worth it. If anything happens, I know I'm going to get it from all sides. You really think some men deserve another chance, don't you? Yes, sir, I do. I wouldn't want you working for me if you didn't. Two more weeks went by. Tuesday, April the 19th. Ben came down with a bad cold and had to lay off work. At the same time, a new gang started a hold-up campaign among the liquor stores out in the Wilshire District. A new rash of armed robberies broke out in the central area. It was an attempted bank robbery. It was a bad week. Ben got back to work on Saturday. Rough time, huh, Joe? Busy, yeah. Did you beat that cold all right? Sure, I feel much better. Doctor gave me some new medicine. Works good. That's fine. Maybe I'll knock off early tonight if nothing's doing. That's a good idea. Shouldn't be too much tonight. Tell the type for you. Just came in. Oh, thanks, Larry. Sure. What's the matter, Joe? What is it? Max Tyler. He broke out of prison this morning. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima doubled, tripled, and quadrupled its smokers. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which... Here it is, boys. Want to mark it for evidence? Yeah, give it to me, will you? I will. Nurse, sterile saline solution. Here we get to old. No sign of Tyler's partner, huh, Joe? Guy got me? No, not yet, no. Still dressings, please. How long did okay. you know this, Tyler? Before he went wrong with me. I met him in the Army. Helped him line up a job when he got out. It's too bad. Sure is funny. Making a friend of yours pull an armed robbery. Must have surprised you, huh? Yeah, kind of. You want me to drive you home when the doc's finished, Jim? Yeah? Let's go back to the office and talk to Tyler first. Okay. Is that all right, Doc? No. You're staying right here, Romero, till tomorrow morning. If you haven't got a temperature by then, I might release it. Oh, it's only a flesh wound, Doc. I feel all right. I'm not taking any chances with gunshot wounds. If infection set in and you were laid up, I'd have the pension committee to answer to. You're staying here. Sounds like an order. It is. You can pick him up in the PNF ward tomorrow morning. Okay. You gonna need anything, Ben? Yeah. A phone to tell my wife I won't be home for dinner. His name was Max Tyler, white, male American, age 32. Dark hair, brown eyes, medium build, married, father of twin boys. He was a friend of mine. We served together in the Army overseas, and when the war finished, I came back to my job on the force, and Max went back to his old job. It didn't fit him anymore. He stopped working and started drinking. His wife didn't help much. Max started with small trouble, but it grew fast. On the afternoon of February the 8th, Tuesday, Ben and I surprised two men holding up a Main Street jewelry shop. Shots were exchanged, and Ben received a flesh wound in the shoulder. One of the hold-up men escaped. The other one was apprehended. His name was Max Tyler. Hi, Larry. Hi, Joe. Glad you got here. Tyler says you won't talk to anybody but you. Okay, boy. Thanks for standing by. Sure. I'll be outside if you need anything. Joe. You're in deep this time. You shot a cop. I didn't. This guy was with me. I didn't fire once. You were in on the job. Yeah. Then don't expect presents. I don't expect anything, Joe. Glad you came back. I, I don't want to talk to those other cops. I work in the same department they do. Same job. Well, it's easier to talk to you. What's your story? I was crazy to try it. No alibis, Joe, but I... I didn't know what I was doing, believe me. I, I just didn't realize... I won't buy it, Max. You told me the same thing 14 months ago when they picked you up for those bum checks you were passing. Sure, I hung some paper, but I'm no hood, Joe. You know that. 
Uh, I was drinking. I needed dough for Dorothy and the kids. You gotta believe me. I need a break. You said that before, too. I went to bat for you. You got off with six months and three years probation. Now you turn up with another caper. I know, Joe. I know. I'm sorry. You're sorry once, Max, and it works. But one free ride's enough for anybody. Now, that's it. Did I say I wanted that kind of a break? I'll, I'll serve my time, Joe. I'll serve every day I owe. I mean, what can you tell me you couldn't have told the other cops? I want to ask you a favor. Yeah? I know you're going to hook me on this. So while I'm doing my time, Dorothy and the kids are staying with relatives out in Inglewood. If you're... Well, just keep an eye on them, you know, Joe. I, I don't mean dough. Dorothy can work with... 